We are talking once again with Ari Cohn. He is president and founder of the Post Prison Education Program, and this is the monthly edition of the Post Prison Education Program radio show. Ari, take it away. Thanks, Mike. Uh, let me introduce everybody that's with me this morning. McKenna Kearns, who uh, has been putting up with me and, and working for with us for two years, and uh, an applicant student yes. services. And Adrian Tunney um, was a student of ours and a, a graduate and a student now getting ready to graduate again, <laughs> another degree and a high value worker in the office. Thank God I called her couple months ago and begged her to come back and to my surprise she said yes and then Ari, glad to be back uh, yeah. <laughs> and then Ari Ari we Ari Ari the younger <laughs> uh, it, uh, Rose Marquez we Ari just finished his uh, internship with us and we uh, asked him to stay and he agreed so he'll be with us till the end of summer when he leaves for USC so there's three topics and I'm I guess we better watch the clock pretty closely and uh, because they're all any one of them we could go an hour on. So if I was um, if I was to net title this this radio show, I would uh, title it something like Julie Martin, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Corrections needs to learn the definition of the word awash, A-W-A-S-H-S, because the prisons uh, that she's responsible for are awash in drugs. And they're awash in drugs at a time when the Department of Corrections cannot, uh, with a straight face, blame the drugs coming into the prisons on prisoners and their families because there have been no visits for more than a year since COVID struck. So the drugs that are awash in the prisons are there because Department of Corrections employees who are supposed to be law enforcement officers have become really expert at breaking laws and destroying lives by bringing drugs into the prisons. Um, the other uh, a second topic uh, is uh, hopefully everybody uh, saw the Seattle Times article yesterday uh, about the Department of Corrections settling $3.2 million uh for the death of a prisoner who was denied medical care uh and, and died a really torturous death and um it, 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 it that article really describes the doc that i've come to know and 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 really despise and um and i hope everybody will read it uh so uh, but I'm particularly interested in that because it matches what is going on with a student of ours who's at the Women's Correction Center um, or, the, or the Washington Correction Center for Women outside of Gig Harbor in Purdy. Uh, and she is being denied medical care to the point that we have gotten lawyers involved. Um, and uh, and so I want to talk talk about that. Um, so, so far, it looks like the, the, apparently the Department of Corrections manual for medical care is if you have cancer, give them Tylenol. That's what it's starting to look like. Don't do biopsies. Don't do MRIs until you until lawyers are involved, threatening a lawsuit. And just give them Tylenol and send them back to their cells. So we we've, we've got a bad situation with a student of ours. At Purdy, and I want to talk about the non medical care. And then, um, lastly, um, in the last couple months, uh, we've had way more than the normal amount of prisoners wanting us to work for them to go before the Indeterminate Indeterminate Civil Review Board, ISRB. And, uh, in the last three weeks, we had um, two, uh, Marley and uh, Ari were involved with one who, I, who uh, I'm not going to say his name, but it was Larry, right, Ari? 
and uh, well, uh, I'm, what's the one I want to say is Blackwell, I think. So uh, I haven't had any personal contact with him, but the other one um, was recommended to us, uh, recommended to me by a prisoner we've known for 10 years that we're heavily invested in working for. And, and uh, we, we were asked to, to help this guy or work for this guy to, to get out. And what we were told about him was like, he's super smart and, um, and uh, no infractions for many, 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 many years and, and, and could do extremely well if released. Uh, and so I ended up in a conversation with this guy and uh, we sent an application in and then very quickly, uh, he and Maddie uh, had like lengthy JPay conversations, and we very quickly became confident he could do well. But we we talked to him about the fact that that I mean, the first question is like, what have you done to the program? What 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 record have you built while locked up that you can show ISRB um, as being reason for you to to be you know set free? And 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 he'd done nothing, and he had done nothing because the Department of Corrections won't allow him or anybody like him to do anything. The DOC will not allow people with long-term sentences to program, which is, you know, it's, so, so the legislature in the governor's office, in, in DOC, when they're talking to media and press, every you, you go to prison for rehabilitation uh, and, and, and to learn to change your life and, 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 and how, whatever work you want to put on it, become a better person, but they won't let you do anything like that. They'll let you go to the yard. You can go to the weight pile. You know, you can play cards, uh, you can deal drugs apparently and, and not get infracted. Uh, you can, but you can't do anything that would impress the, the ISRB. And so, um, I uh, I start I wrote Danielle Armbruster, uh, who's assistant secretary in the Department of Corrections in charge of reentry, about this guy without naming him, and and uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna name him. His name is Douglas Allen, A L L A M, um, and he's a smart guy. And I wrote Danielle about the problem that that, that this guy can't program. And thus has no chance of going before ISRB or, or, or releasing. And 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 kudos to Danielle. Uh, and I mean that sincerely. She she took the time to write a really in depth uh, email to me uh, in response covering this issue. And um, and all of you have seen it. And uh, and so I want to talk about the DOC current policy of blocking long term prisoners from programming. And just so you know, I just looked on the DOC's website a minute ago, and um, uh, there's 48.2% of Washington's prisoners are doing 10 years or more. So like 28.5% of prisoners um, have sentences longer than 10 years. 15.4% uh, have uh, are doing life sentences with chance of parole, and 4.3% are doing life without opportunity for parole. So 48.2% are in this category where they can't program. And actually, it's more than that because if if you if you have more than if you're not four years or under, you have great problems getting into into any programming education class. So. Um, so we're now, I would say, well, I want to, I want to talk about that. And I think, um, let's, let's talk about drugs in the prisons first. Is that, or is that a good place to go? Um, Adrian, you can't be quiet this morning. Yeah, that's a good place to start. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So, 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 so um, I, you know, I, I wrote Steve uh, uh, Sinclair, the, the Secretary of DOC, who was pretty clearly terminated by Inslee, 
Um, I think because of his handling of COVID, but who knows? Um, and Rob Herzog, who resigned as Assistant Secretary of the President's Division several months ago at, uh, about this issue, and and um, and they and Steve wrote back and acknowledged the fact they know DOC headquarters at the highest level. They know that the, the prisons are awash in drugs, but he said that the status quo would remain. So they would continue to not infract prisoners or have prisoners charged uh, if they were bringing drugs. In. And, and this was, um, I think, I may have written Steve pre-COVID or just about the time when visits were cut off. And, 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 um, and I left it alone, but a couple of weeks ago, when I realized DOC was opening up visits for the first time, I thought this is the perfect opportunity to have this discussion because for once in the entire history of the Department of Corrections, they can't, uh, they can't claim that drugs are being brought into the prisons by prisoners, families, and loved ones and friends because there have been no visits. So I took the email I wrote to Steve Sinclair and I, and I forwarded it to Julie Martin and I brought the conversation up again. Um, and, uh, she came back with the most lame brain, inadequate, uh, uh, I'm here. I am Mike wanting to cuss again. And I don't remember if this is on your, the SEC won't allow me to say this, but, um, I mean, a really pathetic answer, uh, that was like. She acknowledged that there's drugs in the prison. She tried to say, yes, some few employees ha have been charged with bringing drugs in, uh, you know, but she tried to suggest that, th that the drugs that are in the prison must be coming in through the mail room. Well, you know what? Aside the volume of drugs that are in the mail room can't, I mean, that are in the prisons can't come in through the mail room. I mean, you can't have a box come into the mail room at Monroe or wherever, and um, and 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 the guard opens it up in the mail room and oh my God, there's bags and bags of meth here, and that and they decide to and they don't let it, you know they don't let it through. So like it's it's, it's not coming in through the mail room, and if it, whatever drugs are coming in through the mail room, they're coming in through the mail room with the permission. Of the of the guards who are DOC staff who are in the in the damn mail room, right? It's just it's just like it's just a it's a fact that that Julie Martin can't lie her way out of or obfuscate her way out of. So like right now in the prisons, there's not a little bit of drugs. The prisons are awash in drugs. Everybody we talk to when they release. They're awash in drugs. I mean, they, they all talk about it, you know, and, and, and they all see it and some are releasing an act of addiction. So like, it's a, it's a, you know, we just had a, a friend I've known for many years who's doing a very long sentence and he's got about nine years to go. And uh, he's being transferred from Monroe uh, down to uh, the West complex of the Washington state penitentiary to an intensive management unit to a, a really harsh program. They call it when they throw you in the hole, that's for a program. Um, and, and he told me before they took him to the hole that he knew he was going to the hole and why he knew that being caught with, you know, in, in dealing, using drugs or whatever in the prisons that he was going to be found guilty in a disciplinary hearing and he would be transferred to the hole. Um, and so he, he just decided like, if I'm going to the hole, I'm going to get loaded. And, and so he, he, he went and got loaded. Right. And, and, and the next day he went to the hole and, and, but the point is he, he could, you could say, I want to get high and get high. It's just, it's it's I don't care. It's Airway Heights, Monroe, Larch, Aberdeen. The prisons are knee deep in drugs, and it's the total responsibility, total responsibility, of the Department of Corrections employees who are supposed to be law enforcement officers. Um, and and uh, I think 
I think I think I'm just going to. I mean, one of the one of the ramifications where I shut up and, look and ask everybody else to talk about it is, is imagine you're coming out of prison, and you're and you don't want to return and you want to build a life worth living, uh, but you come out actively addicted. You're in active addiction. You know, you're using in the prisons, and then you're going to hit the streets, and you won't be able to go three cells down and get drugs. Right, or 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 have drugs handed off to you at whatever designated point. You're going to be on the streets in, in active addiction, and you're going to and you're an addict, and you you need the next, you need more drugs, and then so you're going to act accordingly. You have no chance to successfully reenter society, and that, and maybe that's a good place uh, for me to shut up and. McKenna, Adrian, and Ari, and you guys talk about how that, how you think that plays out, how you see this, the impact of this. Uh, whoever wants to go first, I'm shutting up for the minute. Well, I just want to say <clears throat> right off the bat um, that DLC is contributing to the recidivism and um, not giving individuals a chance to even have a second chance. Um, I can imagine um, there being crack cocaine in the in the prison system when I was there. I probably would have been using that. Um, but the thing that was mostly um, floating around was was meth, and they were sending it in through the mail through the mail room. And they were dousing the paper and letting it dry. I guess they had to use some certain type of paper, but them they know what's going on. Somebody know what's going on. That shit just ain't come. Oops, that stuff ain't just coming through without somebody knowing how it's getting in there. Yeah, the level of scrutiny that even the letters that we send in that are just that, like small letters, face and how many get sent back to us or take weeks to get to the person that they're intended to demonstrates that there's someone who's looking at those. And so I don't know how our innocent applications <clears throat> could be so easily rejected and like large quantities of drugs wouldn't be. And I think it also just highlights so much of the hypocrisy and exploitation that happens so frequently that like so, so, so many of these individuals are behind bars because of this exact thing that we're talking about. Um, and it's just like baffling and so, so gross. Well, and Adrian, you were talking about how it, like DOC itself is contributing to the recidivism and Ari touched on like the fact that if you have an ERD that's a few years out, you can't even get involved in programs. Um, and and then while you're stuck there, you get addicted to drugs that are brought in by the employees. Um, and it's just kind of a vicious cycle that they're not really interested in helping break. And if anything, they're contributing to that. You know, I talked to Julie, go ahead, McKenna, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no, I was just going to say that also might lead us into the flip side of that, which is the lack of health care that's present in the prison system, which also extends to mental health care and the lack of treatment for substance abuse, especially when there's so much substances around. Um, and then, as Ari had mentioned, that's another thing that we wanted to touch on, but I think it extends to this as well. And it's just like such a lack of empathy for the actual like basic human needs that people are demonstrating in really obvious ways and just so disregarded by this larger institution. Uh, I took, it's, I think it's a little bit hard to, uh, McKenna, if you could help me with this because you, you've been there before, but <laughs> to describe the process you go through when you enter a prison, um, I'm going to try to describe it. So there's a there's a box. I remember when these were just first put in, and I think they first went into the West Complex in the Washington State Penitentiary. And 
early on, and I was, Steve Sinclair was, sec, was superintendent back then. And he and I were going uh, into the West complex. And, um, and so you, they put in these metal detectors, sort of almost like an airport um, in the lobbies. And, uh, but they also put in these, um, there's a little box. It's about three or four inches wide and three or three inches tall and maybe six inches this way. And it's got a red button and a green button. And then there's a button or a green, red button, red light and a green light. And then there's a button you push. And I, and if you're the superintendent of the, of, of the particular prison, you still have to, you have to do that. So like, uh, you push the button and if, if the red light comes on, you're going to get searched. I mean, take your shoes off, take your belt off, um, and, and anything you're carrying, they're going to go through it pretty thoroughly. If the green light comes on, you just sail on through. Um, the thing is you can't, to my knowledge, nobody can like determine whether the red light's going to come on or so like if you're a DOC employee working and you're working the desk and the counter where shift change, you know, people come in and out of the prisons. I don't think it's possible to like set that device so that it won't ring red when your friend who you know is carrying drugs in uh, it, it pushes the button. I, th I, I think that's arbitrary, which means, I mean, that the system's going to not controlled by humans and so you push the button and it's going to go red or green and so what if you're if you're if you're a DOC employee if you're bringing drugs into the prison you you have to have pre-arranged with the DOC employees who are running that check-in point Mike you've been in the prison too but I don't know if you've been in with us since these buttons went in <laughs> and uh, so so the person that's going to, you push the button, the red light comes on, you have to be searched. So the, the DOC employee at the counter is going to like take your lunch bag and supposedly search it for contraband. And, and, and if there's drugs in there, in, in, in what you're bringing in to the prison, then they have to see the drugs and purposefully overlook them. And nobody's going to purposely overlook the drugs that they know are there without being part of the cash flow. And I can't emphasize that enough. I think this, you know, you've got enough drugs in the prisons to keep 18,000 prisoners high, right? That's a lot of effing drugs, a lot of effing drugs, and they're readily available. And, and so to, to, for to be bringing in all of those drugs, um, there's a lot of people on the take. I don't know, words don't suffice. I don't know how to describe this. It, it, it's, it's just, it, but it, I, I just, what, I think the point I wanna make is that people who are entrusted with, with working to better prisoners' lives, um, entrusted to obey laws, to enforce laws, not to break laws, not to deal drugs, are dealing drugs in high volume, and it's destroying prisoners' lives and destroying families, and in turn destroying the prisoners' children's lives. Because I think, like eight, last number, I saw, eighty-two percent of Washington's prisoners have, on average, one point nine one kids. So if if you if you're feeding drugs or making drugs available to a prisoner. You're not just screwing up that prisoner's life. There's his, his, her mother, father, sons, daughter, children. You're destroying whole families, and and uh, and that's just. Um, I don't know if you all noticed the other article that came out against DOC the other day, but a DOC employee, and this really struck home with me. At Monroe, shot his his roommate, right, uh, and and when he was arrested. He had meth on his body. So this is a guy who worked at Monroe in the prisons for 14 years. And he's about as law enforcement oriented as, as the devil, if there is such a creature, uh, or maybe even less law enforcement oriented, right? So he, he's care, if he's carrying meth when he commits a murder and using meth, do you think that he just like says, oh, I've got to go to work today. I'm not going to, I'm not going to use, I'm not going to be high, you know? That that person very likely was one of, was was one of the part of the chain that takes drugs in. But it really struck home when I read the article, 
that this guy's out in the parking lot, turns around, shoots his roommate to death three times in broad daylight. When they arrest him, he's loaded with meth, drug paraphernalia and meth. And that's a guy who worked in, in, the, in the prisons for 14 years. And that's the kind of, that's not all DOC employees are like that person or, or would, and many would never even dream of taking drugs in and destroying lives, but enough do take drugs in that it, that, that this just, it's, un, it's un, unimaginable. I, I just, it's just, uh, and what's really clear to me, I don't know what Cheryl Strange and his secretary is going to do, um, but, uh, or not do, but it's really clear to me that, that the outgoing deputy, the outgoing acting secretary before Cheryl came in on the 17th, Julie Martin was just fine with letting things stay the way they were turning her head the other way. Um, and allow the status quo that's been there for years to continue. And I, I don't know what we can say or do about this, uh, but it's just, it's like, there's been no visits for a year and the prisons are awash in drugs. And that can only have happened if Department of Corrections employees are bringing the drugs in or allowed them in, into the mailroom. And I don't care, they're responsible either way, so. Um, Either way, they're responsible. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, it's they, it's a choice they've made, and I think they've made it for cash flow. You know, self enrichment. You know, they need exactly. They need they need a second outboard motor on their fishing boat, or or one SUV wasn't enough, or <laughs> so they need two, or whatever's going on. But it's they're doing it for they're sacrificing prisoners' lives and destroying families for cash flow. And it's, it's, I think, McKenna, what did you say, disgusting a minute ago? The, the word really resonated with me. So switching over to. Can I jump, uh, can I jump in uh, real quick? Yes, please. I, I just kind of like relating this to what you were also, the article we were talking about in the Seattle Times of like, it's baffling how all these drugs are able to circulate through the prisons and yet you have an inmate who is in post-op from abdominal surgery and is given Tylenol and told <laughs> like, good luck. Uh, it's just the, I don't know, like, yeah, disgusting irony. Um, yeah. yeah. I, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of sitting here feeling, helpless and hopeless because I'm trying to think of the words that will convey some high level of passion. Uh, and I can't, words don't suffice for this, but it's, it's just that the prisons are washing drugs, drugs destroy lives and families. And that's happened only because employees of the Washington State Department of Corrections uh, are bringing drugs in. There's been no visits since COVID hit until about two, three weeks ago, they started back. So um, for once, the DOC can't blame prisoners. They have to go look in the mirror and they've chosen not to do it. Uh, anybody, anybody wants to see this pathetic, enraging email that Julie Martin sent me the other day, uh, just write to me at ra.cone at postprisonedu.org and I'll be glad to forward it to you. Let's talk about denial of medical care. So I don't uh, like, I, this isn't me whining and crying, but uh, uh, it's more like pissing and moaning, but uh, <laughs> for the last two or three years, I've been, I've either been dealing with cancer or cancer has been dealing with me. I don't know which it is, but I've had three kinds of cancer in the last couple of years. And I've seen how easy it is to have a biopsy done and how fast the results come back. And, um, and so we've got, uh, a, a woman, uh, out at, out at Purdy, she's 25 years into a 40 year sentence. And I, I firmly adamantly believe shouldn't have spent a day in prison. Um, and we have a tremendous lawyer, Marla Zink, working to get her free. Uh, but she, um, 
she may have cancer and, and, uh, it's bad enough to the point. So she's got lumps and bumps on her body and, uh, uh, primarily on her head and, and, uh, forehead. And to the point where I'm getting JPEG messages, not only from her about extreme headaches, um, but other prisoners, uh, who we're working closely with have written distraught that this woman is, 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 is in, in a bad way. And what, what, um, what really resonated with me or stuck out with me yesterday and already just mentioned it in that Seattle times article was it seemed like DOC's <laughs> answer to every medical problem is, Oh, give you Tylenol. Right. So that's what, that's what Patricia has been going through out at Purdy. It's like, Oh, you've got a, an excruciating headache. Oh, you've got the swollen growth on your head. Um, yeah, and so here's some Tylenol. And then, and, and, and then, you know what, they charge the prisoner for the Tylenol. So anybody goes to Bartell drugs, would you be happy if you were charged $4 for a couple Tylenol? Would that, you think that's a fair price? So the other day, Patricia was finally got, instead of just being handed Tylenol, she was given a prescription. She was charged $4. She went to pill line. And there was nothing there for her. So she ended up paying $4 for nothing. Um, and that, you know, that's despicable. And, and it shows the, the, the lack of uh, caring. So, so then uh, it's, it's gotten worse. Uh, she uh, had her annual mammogram, I think about two weeks ago. And for, and I, I mean, I, don't know uh, enough about two shots versus four shots and uh, uh, like x-rays or whatever you call them. And, but, but I think that whoever was doing the, the mammogram saw enough that instead of doing two shots or whatever, they did four images. And now she's just been advised that there's enough irregularities. Uh, I, I think the term is something to do with cell density and I'm like naive, stupid about this. So like, uh, there's enough irregularities in, in these four images that they, that they're having her come back for more imaging and, and so on. Um, so maybe she's got breast cancer and, and maybe, uh, these lumps and growths on her head are cancerous and maybe not. Uh, but so far their answer, uh, even after we got uh, Marla Zink involved uh, and wrote a letter to Julie Martin uh, uh, and, and then and got an unsatisfactory response. So wrote another letter to Julie Martin and this time got a, uh, such a despicable response from DOC that I called Jack Conley in Tacoma this morning and, and hopefully Marla and I can talk him into stepping up and, and, and taking DOC to task as well as he's taken <coughs> DSHS to task so many times in, over the years. So, but I just, it's just incredible to me that, that you've got excruciating headaches. <coughs> And they don't do a biopsy. I mean, I'm like now because of the last couple of years of my personal experience with cancer, it's like I have to go every six months and I lay down on a table and a doctor and her two assistants to <coughs> go over my body from head to toe. And if they spot something that they think is suspicious, they just take a biopsy. It's so simple. They just cut a piece of flesh, drop it in the tube, ship it to the lab. And within a day, you know, whether it's cancerous or benign, DOC won't even do that. I mean, so we get this really expensive lawyer who works, thank God, at pro bono, low bono rates for us involved. And, and, and we, and, and we can't, e we can't even with the lawyer's help 
get DOC to do the right thing. Not, not as simple as a biopsy. They finally have authorized an MRI, uh, but she hasn't had it yet. Uh, and now there's some indication that maybe she's got cancer from her thoracic cavity up to the top of her hairline. So I don't, uh, I don't know what mentality you have that you devalue human lives so much that you're just willing to let somebody die like the guy who was written about in the Seattle Times yesterday, or, or your answer to every problem is, is here's some time and I'll go back to your cell and lay down. Um, so we got 24 minutes. So basically preventive care is, doesn't apply to prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> and also to so wholly just disregard someone's requests, like she has gone so far as to get lawyers to try and advocate for herself and her own health needs, and they won't even listen. It, like they should listen to what she asks for immediately. Um, but the fact that like they still are taking such control over her body and like what she is like needing to keep herself healthy, that they won't even deliver that for her is again disgusting and despicable well and it's not even i mean i wish i could say that it was like surprising but with this article in the seattle times which i think everyone should read because it i don't know i think it was really impactful for me but th i mean this guy was in i think his name is john Clutch or clutch and he was in pain for and complaining about it and had like a visual like <laughs> wound for 26 days and then he passed obviously and and they did nothing about it so it doesn't surprise me that if someone has a headache they're oh well here's some tylenol and then i mean for those 26 days i'm sure he was paying four dollars a day out of pocket for the tylenol that was doing jack squat um to help yeah it's just awful. You know, Ari, last night, so <clears throat> we've been really super fortunate. I mean, like privileged, really. For six years, <laughs> we've had Seattle Academy seniors uh, do their senior project with us during spring quarter. And we've met the most incredible people, two of whom, that's how I met McKenna. Um, and then how I met, we met Ari and, and, uh, so at the end of the internship, <coughs> staff, uh, uh, convenes all of the interns and they do presentations to, <coughs> excuse me, parents and whoever else wants to, to, to listen and. I, last night, so Marley Dugan and Ari, uh, the presentation this year was by Zoom, uh, and uh, but they they got to talk about um, what they witnessed and what they saw while working with us uh, during their senior project internship. And one of the things that really resonated with me, I mean, everything Ari that you and Marley said. Uh, <clears throat> resonated to the point of tears, really, uh, and and I know it did with Adrian because I was watching Adrian's face last night. <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know is is recognizing the humanity of prisoners. So you know you read the Seattle Times or you read. Whatever media, hater media, Fox News, and uh, and you and you think prisoners are the most outrageous, horrible creatures in the history of the world, or they're actually a separate species or something, right? Uh, and then, but then when you meet them face to face and you work with them to get into school and build futures and reunite and strengthen their families, then then you recognize their humanity. And and you know, like Ari, right, if you could talk about that for a minute, because I think I think. It's, 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 that's what DOC employ, DOC is hiring people that don't recognize the humanity. Go ahead. Yeah, well, and I think, 
I, I'll, I'll touch on that in just a sec, but I also think the other thing is like the humanity of the, um, of the like officers and the employee, the DOC employees working there in, you know, the last month that I've been working for post prison, a lot of what I've experienced is that you have a counselor who's having a bad day and it drastically, affect, like it really impacts what a student, um, what an inmate is able to do that day, what they're able to do for that month. If, you know, the counselor is having a bad day, you can't, um, get them on the phone to, uh, you know, register them for college while they're now four months behind. Um, and so it's, I mean, I think that's a big issue. And I know we've had a discussion with a woman on the phone the other day about um, different things that would make just even the simplest of tasks um, easier. But yeah, the humanity of just the prisoners, I mean, I think is something that um, I think you can't, I don't know, I, I it was eye opening just to like sit down and talk with, with the amount of people that I have talked to also uh, just about who they are. And like, and Marley was saying last night, like, cracking jokes with them, like talking about their families, talking about their life, their future, their hopes and wishes and desires. And, um, and as you were saying, Ari, a lot of them have kids. They just want to like be a better, I mean, it's, it's um, unfortunately, you know, not a super common thing to find people who make a lot of mistakes and then really want to really want to better themselves, not just for themselves, but also mostly with the people I worked with for their kids. Um, so their kids have a role model to look up to. Um, and it's really admirable. Um, and it takes a lot of strength and a lot of determination um, more than I have ever had or needed in my life. Um, and I think there's just a, a certain appreciation that you, um, that you gain for, for both the situation that they're in, but also just the way in which they're handling themselves often with like a lot of, like I was saying, strength and like grace, um, and just getting to know the person, um, like you were saying, rather than, you know, reading an article. Um, is super impactful. And I mean, they're real people. Like, <laughs> I can't even imagine if one of the people we were working with, I've been working with like 20 students directly. If one of the people I was working with was neglected medical care for 26 days, was in pain. I mean, that would be crushing just to hear about. I can't even imagine, you know, being that poor guy's wife, daughter, son, mother. I mean, You know, I, one of my favorite stories, um, and I may have told it on the show before, but years ago, Lori Guilfoyle worked for United Way, and she was on our board of directors, and um, and she had never been to prison. And so we went out to Aberdeen, to the Stafford Creek Correction Center, and we, t you know, we took uh, we took Lori. I mean, we had a lot of people. We had uh, the people from the legislature and we had staff and students and graduates and probably some people who work with Google and, and who knows all else, but we had a lot of people with us and, um, and we met, I think that day we met with 274 men in the, in the visit room. And, uh, you know, you, we do these dog and pony shows and, um, where the it's a two and a half three hour presentation the first is the nuts and bolts of the program how um you know the, the application process and, and so on and so forth and all the forms and budgeting and da, 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 da. and uh, and then the second part is is people former prisoners uh and and mike you've been to several of these uh um uh, tell their story and uh um, and then we have Q and A, which always is the best part, I think. And and so we did we did this day out at Aberdeen, and then we made the drive back to Seattle, which is some form of torture. Uh, and uh, and uh, Lori, her office at United Way was only a block away from our office for 14 years in the Central Building, and. Um, 
And I say so she used to come over at like Quentin times. So we would see her multiple times a week. I mean, four or five times a week. She'd come over, she'd read applications, sit around and shoot the ball. We got back from Aberdeen and we didn't hear anything from her. I mean, there, we, I was like, she didn't call, she didn't drop in. And I, and I was kind of like, okay, what did I say wrong? How did I piss her off? You know, what, you know, uh, and, um, and then all of a sudden, a week after we'd been out at the prison, we got this incredible email that every time I've read it, I just cry. Uh, but she was, she wrote to everybody at the office and the other board members, and she just, she talked about, um, you know, I'm going to really quickly see if I can find it in my outlook. So bear with me for just a second. And, uh, but she talked about what she normally does during a normal week. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and that included talking to her mother every day and, and doing this, that, and the other. Um, and, <laughs> but that for a week she hadn't done anything. Uh, I'm going to, I found it. So I'm going to read it. So. Uh, she says, I've been pretty quiet since our last, since our visit last week. I have a group of really good friends that I go out for drinks with every Friday after work. Last week, I couldn't go. Just did not feel right. I talked to my mom a couple times a week. She lives in Oklahoma. I haven't called her. Saturday, I just got in the car and went for a drive out to Mount Rainier. Every time I talk about it. I cry. Every time I think about the men I met, I cry. Every time I think about Becky, Vance, Dolphy, or Pollard, I cry. I, I cry in my car, at my desk, as I'm working out in the garden. I thought I was okay about people honoring and respecting all people for who they are. But until last week, I don't think I really understood what it means to honor and respect all people for who they are. I have so much to learn. And I thank you. <laughs> deeply thank you for giving me the opportunity you've given me. So that was like, that's somebody who had never met a prisoner uh, in prison. Um, and meeting them and being in the midst of 274 guys and not being scared and recognizing their humanity something that that obviously the people in charge of medical care and the department of corrections at least up until when cheryl strange started on the 17th don't do won't ever do don't care to do um I, and i'll just you know uh, are those tears mckenna yeah Me yes too. they are yeah yeah um, so, um, we're, we've got, we're down to 11 minutes. Who wants to talk about what? I can... Adrian, I think you're muted. No, I am. I was just saying, <laughs> I was repeating what you say. Who wants to talk about what? I'm just... <laughs> I'm tripping off of all of this. Like I've never really thought about all of these topics like we're discussing today. Um, you know, being a person who is a former prisoner, um, I know that um, some of the things that were some of the, I don't know, just some of the things that were, <laughs> I can't even say it. I don't know. It's just crazy thinking about all of this right now, and um, with the with the current pandemic and all that, and just to see that DLC has their basically has their foot on prisoners' necks, and um, that's the only thing I can. That's the visual that I'm getting right now, and I'm so glad that I wasn't exposed to those types of things when I was incarcerated, but I just didn't see them or didn't recognize them, but. Um, I know that they have to exist. They've been doing this shit. I think I always just go back to, um, I think it was Dolphy 
who was interviewed by Teresa Walsh, who I know you guys interviewed um, a few weeks ago, um, or was on the radio show. But uh, he was talking about how, you know, he has a F the DOC. I believe that's Dolphy, right? That's Derek. Um, that's Derek. But that's Derek. Yeah. That's Derek. But, um, but how this this system that is built to incarcerate individuals and discipline individuals is also supposed to be the same system that helps them reintegrate back into society and and supposed to be there for rehabilitation and support and it's i mean it's just blatantly not true because and we all can see that um just through personal experience but um yeah it's, it's i don't I think I just always <laughs> go back to that because it's this, I mean, DOC is there to discipline and it's there to rehabilitate. And those two things just are so contradictory. Um, there's no wonder why there's so much like disdain and disgust for, for the whole system. You know, for, the, for everybody who didn't, uh... For anyone who didn't listen to uh, um, uh, our interview with Theresa Walsh, the University of London research student, um, last month, the, the, one of many things that she said during the interview that may have been in her thesis also was that um, Whatever had, has been proven to be the best thing to do, DOC is doing the opposite. <laughs> and, and and if it's like, if if research and years of, of of life's experiences and study show unequivocally this is what should be done, then you'll find DOC over here doing the exact opposite. It's uh, it, <laughs> and. That's, you know, I don't know. It's not sad. I, I don't even know what the words are. To, to, I don't even know how to. Um, yeah, it's the just question. the. Sorry. Go, ahead. go ahead. No, sorry, you go. Oh. Um, but it feels like the, the constant disregard of both information that's coming out and then also just like humanity and human emotions and like Ari too um, was referencing earlier um the fact that there's like so much control over these individuals which doesn't acknowledge humanity on that front but then also like it's just like individuals on the other side of that from the doc who have complete control and so there's like so much room for human error and like human bias on the other side because it's just like such unchecked power and like these individuals and uh, like not necessarily to the fault of the counselors but like when they have a bad day and can't come in like that again has earth shattering consequences for an individual on the other side and it seems just like so counterproductive and counterintuitive for everyone on all sides of that system like including people who want to lower recidivism rates for whatever reason that is it just like is so illogical i think and doesn't make any sense and like I, with so many things if like the care was taken to try and analyze why things aren't working on a larger scale like people are doing like teresa is trying to do it do like that kind of research just so often isn't even listened to or followed through on all right um I was just going to ask you, actually, you wanted to, uh, you being the other Ari, um, and maybe Adrian as well, but um, I know you were talking about titling this about um, this show about how the prisons are awash in drugs. I was wondering if you or Adrian could maybe um, touch on what you think some of those solutions that you would like to see DOC implementing could be. You know, I, I, I'll talk first and then Adrian can go and then we're going to be out of time. But, you know, when I, I, I was out at the women's prison uh, and I think McKenna was with me. <laughs> uh, 
pre-COVID, obviously. And um, I was uh, walking with a, a, an assistant superintendent who I regard as a personal friend, and I've known for a long, long, long time, way more than a decade. And we were talking about the issue of drugs coming into the prisons. And I'm not sure, and she didn't say, she didn't even intimate that this was the case, but I think that she had been moved from Monroe down to Purdy because it was such a huge problem with drugs at, at Purdy. And so like, um, but that, that day, she told me that I think the day before uh, a, a bus had come in from the Paris County jail and um, and a woman had had 13 grams of, of meth in her body. And, and she said front and back, so rectum and vagina, 13 grams. And so she, first thing is she came out of the Pierce County Jail. So she came out of the jail with that much drugs in her body. And then they catch it at, at DOC and and, you know, my, and I hesitate to say this even to, to this day, and, and it's what caused me to delay writing to Steve Sinclair and Rob Herzog a year or so ago, but I think people, whether they're a, a prisoner or a, a former prisoner or a DSC employee or the governor's general counsel or Santa Claus, I don't care who you are, if you're bringing drugs into the system, I think you should be prosecuted. <laughs> and so I think that I think when I wrote to Steve and, and Rob Herzog that first time, uh, I was advocating that people be prosecuted because that stuff will stop. And, and, and honestly, you know, there's all this conversation about rat mentality. If you do this, you're a rat, you do that. And I hate rats. When I was locked up, I was, if, some, if, a, if, a, if, a, if somebody was known in the prison as a rat, ended up with a pencil in their Adam's apple, frankly, I was fine with that. So, but so, but when it comes to be quiet, Adrian, but, 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 but if, if you, if, if you're, if you're so egocentric, avaricious, that you don't give a, damn about other people's lives to the extent you'll bring drugs into the prisons and destroy families, not just a single prisoner's life, but families, then I don't care if they put you under the jail. So, and I, I, I'll tell you, you know, when I was a kid, there was this black and white, there were things called black and white televisions. The, the, you could probably go to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. and actually see one, right? And, um, and, uh, the, uh, we're down to two minutes. <laughs> anyway, um, there was a show called Peyton Place, and it was about how in, people in the small community were rumor mongering, gossipy people. Nobody can gossip and, and rumor monger as well as prisoners. So if something happens in the prison column by two seconds later, I guarantee you the network will let prisoners in Walla Walla, 300 miles away, know, know about it. If, if DOC starts having people be in for, charged for bringing drugs into the prison, whether the DOC employees or or prisoners or prisoners' families, word will get out, and I and it won't totally stop it, but it'll make a, a big headway, and I'm fine with that. If if you if you're if you, if you want money so bad, you're willing to destroy people's lives. I don't give a damn about you, and I and, and it's fine with me if you get prosecuted buried under a jail. So I think, I think prosecutions are, are key. I'll probably get a lot, a lot of backlash to that, but Adrian, you got 53 minutes, 53 seconds. The only thing I can, the, the word that comes to my mind is accountability. And as a um, former prisoner, I was accountable for my actions and, and went through the process of being sentenced and everything. And then when to, to, to get to a prison and think that, um, I can be treated in a certain way where my life chances are just eliminated because of the way that these people that are supposed to be directing me or con or you know controlling me or whatever. I just feel like um, there needs to be some accountability by DLC for their actions and how they're um, treating prisoners and how they're allowing drugs to come into the prisons, how they're denying prisoners medical care which is a right 
So accountability is my word for the day <laughs> for DLC. Amen.